All right, here we have a uh, energy versus position graph for a box on a spring. You can see that when we change the spring constant, the, uh, the shape of the graph changes, and then when we increase the amount that it's stretched, uh, we are raising the total energy um, that's actually in the spring system. Changing the mass doesn't really do anything. Even if we stretch this out, the mechanical energy increases. If we change the mass, nothing happens. Now, if we let this object start to move, we see that the potential and the kinetic energies are changing into each other. Now, the points where the kinetic energy is at the lowest are the turning points. That's when it's turning around. In the middle, you have maximum velocity and no potential, and then you go to the other turning point on the left where the velocity is again zero and it's physically turning around. So this is how the potential energy function looks for this type of a system. Um, we can change certain things, like if we lower the spring constant, we're lowering the total energy that's stored in the spring. And you can see that the kinetic energy transfer is a little bit slower. You still have the same features. You have turning points where the velocity is zero, um, and the maximum velocity is in the middle where the potential energy is going to be zero. Isn't this just mesmerizing? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, so now that you have an idea of how the potential energy graph looks with an object that's, you know, moving with some sort of potential energy like this spring, let's take a look at some of the, the important features of the graph. Um, so you know that these points right here, like we said, are the turning points where the mechanical energy and the potential energy graph intersect, and that's where the object will literally change direction. Uh, and you know that the lowest point right here is where the object is going to have the highest velocity um, and the least potential. But let's take a look at the slope. So Let's say I wanted to look at the slope right here at this point. I drew a line that was tangent to that point. Well, if I look at the rise and the run, I've got delta x and delta u. Okay, that's the, the potential function. So let's write that. Let's talk about the slope as being delta u over delta x. All right, now what I'm going to do is think about how a change of potential energy uh, is actually equal to a negative work that's being done. So for example, um, while the object moves to the right, the spring force is to the left. Now what that means is that the spring is doing, you know, I'll draw the velocity, the spring is doing negative work on the box as it moves to the right. And as that negative work is done, potential is added to the system because the spring can potentially pull the box back. Okay, well, I know that negative work, Sorry, that should have been an S. I know that negative work is just negative force times delta X. And lo and behold, if I know that on the left side I have delta U and on the right side I have delta X, I can divide both sides by delta X and find this really important relationship that the change of potential over the change in X is equal to the negative of the force, which coincidentally happens to be the slope of our potential energy graph. Okay, so what that means is I can look at a potential energy graph, and if I can find the slope at any point, I know what the force is. Um, remember that we have a way of expressing uh, finite changes, or deltas, as infinitely small changes, or infinitesimal changes. So instead of delta ux, I could say, well, as the change in x, so the limit, that's delta x approaches zero. As the change in x gets really, 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 really small, we can really just call that du dx, and that's going to be equal to the negative force. So this is your, your new thing to think about. The slope of a, a um, potential energy versus position graph is going to tell you the negative of the force. Um, so let's take the example of a spring. Right, you know that the potential energy in a spring is half of the spring constant times x squared. Well, let's say you know that the spring constant is 200 newtons per meter, and you are tasked with finding the force of the spring at 0.5 meters. Well, now we know that if we take the derivative of that function with respect to x, so that's like saying uh, d dx one-half k x squared, we're going to find what the force at that position is. Now if I take this derivative, all I do is reduce x by 1 and then multiply both sides by 2, and what I get is, um, oh, sorry, this, I should write a, I should write it like this, equals negative f. So I'm going to get negative f equals 
kx, or that's like saying f equals negative kx, which happens to be Hooke's law. Um, if I did this with numbers, I could write the potential graph as half of k, or 100, x squared. And then I would write it like this. If I want to find the negative force, then I take the derivative of u with respect to x, which I can really write that as d dx 100 x squared. Um, and then I would bring the two down so that I get negative f equals 200 x. And now I know that the force equals negative 200 x. And if I want to find the force at 0.5, meters, then all I need to do is take 200 newtons per meter and multiply that by 0.5 meters, which half of 100 is, sorry, half of 200 is 100. Multiply that by negative 1, the meters cancel out. And there, I've figured out the force in the spring. Uh, but let's say you didn't have something like a spring. Maybe you had some goofy function that behaved kind of wildly. So let's say you knew that the potential, and here I'll write it u of x, the potential energy graph uh, followed a function that looked like this. 20x cubed minus 3x plus 2. And you wanted to find the force of this object at 2 meters. Well, then we would say, okay, the negative force is equal to the derivative with respect to x of that function. And then I just take the derivative of this function. The derivative of 20x cubed, I'm going to reduce x by 1 and then uh, multiply by 3, so I get 60. Then I'm going to have minus 3 and the 2 goes away. Okay, so I know negative f equals 60x squared minus 3, or the force is negative 60x squared plus 3. Now to find the force at 2 meters, I just plug in 2. All right, so 2 times 2 is 4, times negative 60 is negative 240, plus 3 is negative 237 newtons. All right, so that's how you can use the potential energy function to figure out what the force at a certain position is.